I hope you've enjoyed the talk so far. Today, we'll be talking about our journey, the freezing Omanis. It's a strange concept, right? I mean, we're two Omanis in coming from a desert country. It gets up to 50 degrees in summer. Freezing Omanis? Now, while the place that we went to is technically classified as a desert, it's not any sort of desert that we can find here. Temperatures, instead of reaching plus 40, plus 50, reaches negative 30. Where we went to was Antarctica. And it all started just over a year ago, when Ben and myself heard of an opportunity to be part of a unique movement of environmentalists, to be able to make a change in the world in one way or another. Now, this movement is organized by an organization called 2041. And more specifically, we're part of something called the Antarctic Youth Ambassador Program where the goal of it is to feed and, and instill knowledge of sustainability, of renewable sources of energy, teach us about climate change, about global warming, and in doing so, create an army of equal warriors, if you will. You know, the guy who started this thing, Rob Swan, he believed in one thing. You have to see something, you have to feel it, you have to touch it, to actually be inspired by it. During his South Pole expedition, he went on, and on his way back, he suffered from something called snow blindness, which is the UV rays hitting and reflecting onto your eyes. He almost lost his sight. His eyes went, were bright blue, as bright as could be, and now they're forever turned gray. He felt that impact of global warming and climate change, and he wanted young people like us to feel that. He didn't want to pick up anybody to do this. He wanted to pick up people who were motivated enough to come back to their countries and then do something about it. So, as Beda said, there's a unique criteria for those who want to participate in the expedition. And when Beda and myself heard of it, we both went our separate ways, we both sort of applied for it independently, and then little to our knowledge, friends of almost 14 years both got selected to be part of the expedition. I didn't know that he got picked until I called his brother, which is somewhere here. <laughs> um, so before actually going on to the expedition, before actually hopping on a plane, hopping on a boat to go to one of the coldest places on Earth, um, there was quite a bit of a journey before that. We used months of preparations, whether it's ment mentally, physically, financially, and what we're going to try and do today with you guys is sort of bring you along on the journey with us and compress it from the six, eight months that we had to about the next 15 minutes or so. You know, our first journey started off in our home country, Oman, with our sponsorship hunt. Now, at this stage of the journey, which, yes, it was part of the journey, it taught us very many skills that we had to sort of hold on to and then keep. It taught us patience, it taught us perseverance. It taught us that we need to raise, we needed to raise a sum of money in order to pay for the expedition, in order to pay for insurance, train, uh, plane tickets, I'm sorry, uh, equipment that we needed. And after many, many rejections, after many doors slammed in our faces, we had to persevere. So uh, 85 of them, right? 85 no's. Not that I'm counting. <laughs> and that was still only one part of the challenge before actually going on to the main challenge, the expedition. Another bit was a bit more physical. So, how do you train for something like this? I mean, we have beautiful Oman with amazing wadis, mountains that we could trek, we have the gym to go to, we could do that, but how do you train yourself for minus 30 degrees? So, contacted one of my sponsors and thought, you guys are a logistics company, you have freezers, can you give us your freezers for six hours a week so we could just hang out in them? <laughs> you could imagine the response from the GM of HR. He was like, uh, did, have, have you been on something? So that's exactly what we did. Now, we stuck there for a long, long time, and that created a different challenge. We didn't have anything to entertain ourselves with. Um, those, uh, there are some people over here that I know that I've taken to the freezer with us. They know that phones don't work, laptops don't work, nothing works. Phones literally freeze up. And what we had to do, just read books and chill out. And we had quite a lot of time to think. Now, 
one of the things that we sort of came up with while we're there is one of the things that we had to do as part of the expedition is raise awareness on, on environmental issues, on uh, get people excited, get the youth excited in it. So how, how do we go about doing that? Well, we thought social media. So while we're sitting there in the freezers, to the best of our capabilities, before our equipment froze up on us and then sort of disappeared and stopped functioning, we decided to break two world records. One of them being um, the coldest tweet up. So there are most of our Twitter celebrities, locally Twitter celebrities, in the freezer discussing uh, environmental, environmental yeah. issues. We called the tweeter in a freezer. The other one was the coldest, uh, or the most amount of blogs submitted from a freezer. You might see that that photo is a little bit fuzzy. That's because our cameras froze up. We had to take them out for a while, dethaw them, and then quickly take a snap before they freeze again. A few so challenges. Even then, so finally we had, um, we were mentally so, sort of ready, if you could be. Um, financially, we had our sponsors, but then we needed equipment. Hmm. Not a very easy job. You can see that's a lot of equipment in there. And I don't think any smart businessman in Oman would go, hey, let's open up a place where we could sell snow gear. So we had to go to neighboring countries about three, three, on three different occasions. And even then, it was very difficult to sort some of this stuff. We had to get some of this stuff from the US and Germany. And it just took months. And I think the last bit of our gear arrived a week or two before we actually head there. Like, we actually got on a plane. I was like, oh, OK. Yeah, so that was sorted in the nick of time. So now we're ready, physically ready. Mentally, yeah. somewhat ready, sort of prepared for it. Short on cash, but Short on good cash, enough. A little bit. We have our equipment. We're good to go. So on the 26th of February, Ben and myself hopped on a plane and began our journey to Antarctica. We went from Moscow to Oman to a quick stop over in Rio de Janeiro, Brazil. Afterwards, and at about this time, how, how long have we been traveling? I think it was 29 over, hours. I 29 think it was. hours. 29. Got to the airport and completely exhausted, completely <laughs> exhausted, hoping that within four hours we'd hop on the next plane and finally go to the city where we'd meet the rest of the expedition members. Little to our knowledge. Yes, our plane was canceled. Yeah, not only that, we didn't book any hotels and we were in, um, well, Rio, um, sorry, Buenos, Buenos Aires. Aires. So it's not the safest city. We had to sleep in shifts. It's not a random guy that took our photos. <laughs> so we had to sleep in shifts. And funnily enough, our next plane got delayed as well. So Eventually, all yeah, things come to an end. All bad things we hopefully come to an end. So we get to Ushuaia, beautiful city of Ushuaia, southernmost city in the world. And this is where we met up with the other expedition members. This is where we met roughly 80 people from around the world experts in, in fields and sustain, sustainability, in renewable energies, in climate change. We had people from, uh, we had the VP of Shell. We had amazing characters on the expedition with us. And it was here where we were first taught. We stayed here for a couple of days to learn basics of uh, safety, mountaineering skills, rope skills. We were also taught about the history of the 2041 organization. And these are all sort of skills that we will be needing during the expedition. And we put it to the first test when we hiked up the Marshall Glacier. Now, the Marshall Glacier is a mountain rather than an ice cap that's located right next to Ushuaia. And it has a bit of a story to it. This is where we first started seeing the effects of climate change and global warming in not in Antarctica itself, but surrounding areas. The top of uh, the, the Marshall Glacier, I'm sorry, usually year upon year is covered with uh, an ice cap, a nice thick ice cap where the villagers and the citizens of the city of Ushuaia uh, take the fresh sources of water. But what's been happening is that year upon year, the ice cap has been getting smaller and smaller. And the people, the, the citizens, are extremely worried that they have no idea what they're going to do next. The sources of water, the only source of fresh water is dwindling. So before we actually get there, we're actually seeing the effects. And it's, it's a global phenomenon. It's, it's happening. Then our first real Antarctic challenge began we headed through something called the Drake Passage. The Drake Passage is well known for being the roughest sea patch in the world. 
We were there, and this, we went through a relatively easy drag. You could see that's, that's the kind of waves that we faced. So it was what, six to eight meters, wasn't it? Yeah, roughly. Roughly six to eight meters of waves. And everything was rocking back and forth. People were rocking back and forth. On the first day of our two and a half day journey through the Drake, 80% of our expedition got seasick. Now, there's a funny story with that. We were taught we should Drake-proof the, the cabins by duct taping everything. Through the night, Emir was waking up constantly because our our boards and our tables were just flying back and forth. And in the morning, he was like, dude, you know what? I drake proof, I put some duct tape, everything was perfect. At that moment, the drake just listened and every single thing flew off right in his face. <laughs> so, yeah. It was at the drake as well where we encountered our first wildlife. Things like the albatross, it was amazing to see things like this. You know, you see this in a picture, but when you see a whale right next to you in real life, you, every single expedition member just went rushing at the front of the, the, the sea spirit. And we saw things like, we were taught that birds like the albatross, they sleep mid-flight. That's, that's such an amazing thing for us to just comprehend. And that was our first encounter before we even got to the Antarctic. Now, after about two and a half days on the boat crossing the passageway, we finally got to our first destination within the Antarctic Peninsula, a place, a little place called Mikusan Harbor. Now, this place here, I don't know if you can see it, but there's a little cabin. I'm pointing this out. Oh, That's right there. Yeah. So it's a little cabin over there. What well, the cabin is there, it has a bit of historic value to it. Um, we were told that whatever expedition members, whoever wants to go to Antarctica, if they, if they find themselves on hard times without rations, without food, supplies, radio, they can go into this, which is owned by the Argentinian uh, base. They can go use whatever they need. They have a common understanding down there that everyone helps each other. But with the sole, per, or with the sole condition that you do resupply the rations, you do restock whatever you did, you, whatever you did use. And it was here in Mikkelsen Harbor where we first came across, oh, before that. So it was here where we first managed to plant the Omani flag. It was a great honor and achievement for the both of us. Yeah, especially you, you became the youngest Omani. I became the youngest Omani to go down to Antarctica, which is also a personal great achievement. Thank you. And it was here where we saw remains of, of times long past, of old boats, of whale bones that have been there and have stayed there for years upon years, and it's unlikely that they'll go anywhere. It's a, this is a very, very specific crew or condition. If you go to Antarctica, don't leave anything behind. Don't take anything with you. It's one of the last sort of untouched, untamed, unexploited places on Earth, and it's our responsibility for whoever goes down there to keep it that way. One of the beautiful things that we came across firsthand was the wildlife. Um, the penguins, these guys are Jintu penguins. And are we so going to talk about the poo? Yeah, we're going to talk about the poo. So yeah. one thing I want to point out. We always talk about the poo. Um, the rule told before we went to Antarctica is that you smell the penguins before you get there. And we didn't quite get into actually, well, experience it firsthand. And I don't know if you, you could probably tell that there's a bit of a color difference between this bit here and the beautiful white snow over Just there. Just a little bit. Just a little bit. That is not moss. That is not mud. That is the penguins' living quarters. They, they poo, they pee, and then... Well, what does it, it, it smells like rusty nails and rotten prawns. Something like that, but... I miss it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> One of the things that personally astonished me being down there is the penguins themselves have... What you find uncommon in today's world is they have not learned to fear humans yet, which is incredible. You can stand there, and they would actually be curious. They'd walk up to you, they'd peck at your feet, they'd, they'd stare at you, wondering, what is this thing that's, that's coming to my home? But they wouldn't be afraid. They have no land-based predators, except for the, uh, the, the seals, which are more dangerous in the water. But the penguins themselves have incredible characteristics. If you sit there and you sort of look at them and observe them, they all have their own sort of personalities. 
Um, you can see this guy over here, the forever alone penguin, sitting in the back. You see this one sort of yelling at the other penguin. It's incredible characters. You know, it wasn't just the wildlife that we got to see. It was amazing topography. After that, we went to a place called Iceberg Graveyard. Now, this place is, has absolutely beautiful topography. The place is, basically, icebergs go there, and because of the shape of the place, they stay there until they melt away, which absolutely is perfect for wildlife. There we got very close to fur seals. See that little black and white thing? That's, that's our zodiac. And right next to it comes a fur seal. They just look at us and ignore us, as if we don't exist. It wasn't just seals. We saw whales. Whales that would just come insanely close. And to see that upright in nature, it just feels amazing. You hold your breath, and you kind of forget that you do need to breathe. It wasn't very helpful. But then, that's exactly this, the, the view that you would see. Everybody's just looking in one direction, and then somebody else goes, hey, look something else over there. So there's too much to see in such a short span of time. Your mind kind of struggles to cope with how much there is to see. And it was then that after that, we went to a place called Spurt Island. That place was our camping night. Our our survival night, our moment, the coldest night where we would ever face. That is pretty much how we slept. No igloos, no tents, nothing. We just laid an ice wall, we put the sleeping bags on top, and we just slept. That's pretty much us trying to dig through it. And the way they, they, they put us in there, and there wasn't enough time to look at the scenes, because sunlight was going down. So we had to really work in a team and really work fast, really work hard. But then, that's our reward. This is unedited. This is not an edited photo. This is just how it came. This was our view, and exhaustion after that. You're, you want to sleep, but then you look at something like that. That's not the aurora, by the way. That's the Milky Way. That's just how we're supposed to see things if there was no light pollution going on around us. This is just how we saw it every day. Now, after Spirit Island, uh, we put all the knowledge we sort of obtained throughout the expedition onto one of the last destinations, a place called Brown Bluff. It was here we were told we were going to experience one of the most dangerous hikes or, um, yeah, hikes during the expeditions because of crevasses. And what, during the, uh, the training that we had, we had to be tied to each other. So in case someone falls, the whole team members would fall onto the ice as well and make sure that they don't slip and drag everyone else with it. So teamwork was, was highly um, regarded here. And the crevasses, they can see in this picture, this is a fairly small one. They go down hundreds of meters. These are very, very dangerous. But it was an experience nonetheless on its own. You know, at that point, it was exhausting. We were sleep deprived. We were tired. We were absolutely knackered. There was, that was, that was, every step was difficult. But then that's where our training, that's where when we were at the freezers, when we were trekking in the wadis, each step of that really, really paid off at that pinnacle point when we had that hardest point of the expedition. It's just one step, or one step at a time. Now, the last actual place, destination that we went to was a place called Bellingham Station. This is where multiple countries have their bases. Now, they don't, no one actually owns any land in Antarctica, but they do have claims to it. So this, the Russian bases, the Chilean bases, the Argentinian bases, the Chinese base, and so on. And they all work in different time zones, which is really funny. So it could be four in the, four in the afternoon in one place, go 200 meters to the side, and it could be three in the morning for them. Don't, don't ask me. Um, one of the places, the, uh, the organizer of the expedition, a gentleman by uh, Robert Swan we mentioned earlier, established the e-base. It's, it's a small hut, as you can see, that does various different uh, scientific research and, and studies. Now, it's completely, completely powered by renewable sources of energy. And his sort of ideology behind this is that if this can be established in one of the most remote and isolated and versatile places on the planet, why can't it be done elsewhere? Why can't this technology that's readily available be established on a wider scale? 
Now, being the last day, we, we got to experience one of the best endings ever. It's a beautiful, beautiful sunset, and it was really one of the pinnacles of our expedition. I mean, we had to come back to Amman after such a big hype. It wasn't the end for our expedition, though. I mean, for us, that was pretty much a starting point. We got back to Amman, and so many things happened. Uh, 2041 has nominated me to be the regional mentor for the Middle East. So my job was to look for the next freezing Omanis, train them, help them with sponsorship, and pass on the torch. Actually, there's one freezing Omani who's here today. Um, but that was our mission. We had our environmental campaigns that we took there. We had to bring them back. Mine was the reduction of plastic bags. And hopefully that's kicking into a bit of a smaller gear right now. And I think, Emir, you're... Yeah, um, we are running short on time. We don't want to take from anyone else's time. But if you want to ask me during the break time, I'd be more than happy to answer your questions. Um, on a final note, what we, do ha what we have learned and from, from the experience itself is that even though we may be here, our sort of involvement with the surrounding environment has a larger impact on, on everything around us. And it's up to us. We do have the capability and the capacity to make a change here that affects the world on a global scale. And it's our responsibility. And on that note, um, well, one more thing. To take you on our journey, we've brought something with us that's quite interesting. We trained in freezers that we told you about. We brought one of them down here so that you could experience it once you finish the stock and get out. So we do welcome you to our training grounds once we finish here. And on that note, yeah. Thank you very much Thank for your you. time.